I got put during um, the nap time slot, so I'm appreciative that they opened the window and I will do my best to, to try to keep you awake. Um, so I'm Rebecca Scheiner, I'm at Colgate, and um, I'm gonna be describing a project that I have been um, collaborating on um, at the University of Minnesota with Ann Mastin um, for about the last 15 years. So before I came here, I talked to a good friend of mine who is an uh, economics professor at Colgate about how I ought to speak to economists. And, um, and so he may have misled me. You can tell me if this is not true. Um, he said, we always wear togas. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he said, we always start with uh, a summary of uh, what we're about to tell you, sort of like an abstract. Is that true, economists? Sometimes, okay, well, so anyhow, I, so in, in deference to that culture, I'm starting with a summary. Okay, uh, so my talk is about uh, personality traits in childhood and their development um, from childhood through adulthood. So we know that personality traits do, in fact, change over time. So there is continuity um, by around the age of three or so, fairly substantial continuity, but there's also change. But we don't necessarily know that much about what predicts change over these very long stretches of time. So, um, so I'm going to be addressing the question of whether we can predict those changes. Uh, and I'm going to be using, I'm going to be looking at three different predictors. One is the parenting that children are the recipients of um, during childhood. Uh, one, and then two of them have to do with children's competence in what I'm going to describe later as being sort of developmental tasks. Uh, one of them is academic achievement, and then the second is children's social competence uh, with their peers. And so the data I'm going to draw from is the Project Competence Longitudinal Study. This was, I think, one of the original, if not the original, study of risk and re of resilience uh, in development. And so in childhood, at age 10, we have information on the children's personality traits, and then we also have information on the predictors that I just mentioned. Uh, and then the, the sample was followed up. Uh, at several points, but I'm going to focus on the age 30 assessment uh, where we have information about their adult traits. And so then I can address the question of what predicts change in those traits from age 10 to age 30 uh, and what, what can we expect. And so in terms of the, the results, you'll see um, parenting quality is important, but it does not seem to predict change in all of the traits, and I'll explain um, which ones. And then uh, also children's academic achievement and their social competence also predict change in particular traits that, that are relevant to those domains. You mean academic achievement being years of schooling? Or? No, so you'll see, but it's gonna, uh, it has to do with uh, their, it's measured using an academic achievement test and, and uh, teachers' ratings. Okay, so first I just wanna provide a little bit of background about what we know about personality traits. Um, so there's this old view of personality traits that they are um, static, they, they are often caricatured as being sort of non-developmental. Um, this, this, this was only uh, a year or so ago, someone who was the president of the, the major child development organization wrote an article that was at the, at the front of our newsletter that said, um, we should never use the word trait, that it's anathema to developmentalists because it connotes this idea of something being static and, and inherently non-developmental. So unfortunately, there's often a problem when we discuss personality traits with developmentalists because they, they just, um, they, they are sort of repulsed by even the term. Uh, Whereas the reality is that we know that personality traits are dynamic. And so we know that they, they are dynamic in the sense that they help to organize our behavior um, in ways that, um, that, that vary over time. And they themselves change over time. And most of the work on change in personality has addressed change in, in one of two ways, and I'm going to be focusing on, on the first of these, but I just wanted to mention both. So one is what's called rank order stability, um, which is, is where people stand relative to each other on traits over time. All of our discussion of, of change and stability has focused on that so far today. 
Um, but you can also look at mean level change and stability over time. And what that refers to um, is do the average levels of a trait vary at different points in the life course? So I don't know if any of you have come across this recent press about um, how the youngest generation, the current generation of young people is more narcissistic than others. Have you seen this? It was on Time Magazine. <laughs> the me, me, me generation. I hate that research. but. I'm sorry? I thought there was a psychologist uh, making that point, right? Yes, yes. Well, well, right. So I, I, I mean, I have a lot of opinions about that research, but, but that's just an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about where, where you're looking at are there changes uh, across the life course. But that's cohort. That's, cohort. that's partly cohort and it's partly, yeah, it's partly mean level. So they're trying to make the argument, it's confounding the two. They're trying to make the argument that um, there's a change in the, the cohort um, when, in fact, the reality is probably that there's mean level change, that just as people get older, they get less narcissistic. OK, but, um, but back to the, the main kind of continuity I want to talk about, which is rank order continuity, which is how, how um, stable do you tend to remain uh, in terms of your relative placement. And I'm sure most of you have seen this already, right? This is the, the meta-analysis from Brent Roberts in terms of stability uh, across the lifetime. And I, I just wanted to highlight, does this work? Yeah, that um, it's really sort of, there's a jump around the age of three or so where the stability increases, and then it actually stays about sort of in that range up through college age. Um, so that already by kind of preschool age, there is moderate stability to traits. What happens when you turn 40? 40? Uh, that's insignificant. Okay. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> It's not a midlife crisis, no, no. Yeah, it does, but it's not, yeah, no, that's a good question, but it, the, the, there's no real drop. Okay, so um, in terms of what might lead to changes in rank, uh, please, uh, individuals sort of place in terms of rank order stability, you could think about environmental factors, so this would be things like parenting, which I'm gonna be talking about more. Um, there's research on the school context and how that affects it. Uh, you could look at stress, you could look at socioeconomic status, um, but then you could also think about intrapersonal factors like IQ. So do brighter kids tend to change in a certain direction over time? You could think about neuro neuropsychological skills and then competence, which I'm going to be talking more about today as a contributor. So I, um, I am looking at some of these other factors in the data set that I'm going to present. Um, but today I wanted to focus on the factors that I guess I see as being more potentially amenable to change um, because these could be possible targets for intervention. So I'm going to talk about parenting. Does parenting make a difference for personality change? And then also kids' competence and life tasks. OK, so first in terms of parenting, um, there is this classic notion um, that was introduced into research on temperament by Thomas and Chess. I don't know how many of you have heard of t goodness of fit. I don't know if that is a widely, okay, so only a few of you. Okay, so the idea, um, Thomas and Chess were the people who, who first kind of got researchers excited about studying temperament in young children, and they wanted to present an optimistic view, and, and they believed it was reality-based that um, it was not the case that certain temperament traits would, would necessarily lead to negative outcomes, but that rather it would depend on the goodness of fit to the environment. So the idea was if the, if the environment could accommodate the needs of children with particular difficult temperaments, then their outcomes could still be positive. And so it's an optimistic view um, in the sense that the outcomes are gonna depend on the context, um, and particularly Thomas and Chess emphasized the parenting that kids receive. Most of the research on parenting quality has tended to focus on two dimensions, and you'll see I use, I use a combination of these in my measure. So one key dimension is called often acceptance or warmth, which has to do with um, sort of the, the affection, um, the, the kind of emotional acceptance, the willing to be flexible and to negotiate with one's children. Um, and then the other, the other dimension has to do with, with rule setting, limit setting, and following through on those limits. So having expectations for your kids and then following through to make sure that they meet those expectations. 
how would that differ from some of these notions of attachment, that also attachment? Oh. Right, so attachment, right, is um, usually measured in, in younger kids. I mean, you can measure it in older kids as, as well. But attachment has more to do with that first dimension. I mean, it's more predicted by this kind of warmth aspect. Because when you have a little kid, you know, you're not, I mean, you have to start setting rules. But with an infant, you know, you're not saying, you know, you must complete this many puzzles by 3 a.m. No, I, 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 I guess what I'm trying to get at is a distinction between the attribute of the parent and the attribute of the relationship. Right. I mean, right. it's, it's, right. really, it's, a bi it's, it's really a, a, a property of a match rather than of a, rather than of a person. Right. So Attachment is conceptualized as a relationship between two people. It's not just the parenting style. So how would you put, so in that sense, it's, it's both the child and the parent. Right. These have more to do with just what are the parents doing toward that particular child. But do you have data on attachment per no, se? Because the oh, data no. I'm going to present started, the data collection started at age 10 and it was, um, you know, sort of too late to measure attachment in the standard way that you do with infants. But I'm thinking how attachment relates to things like mentoring. I don't want to break up your okay. talk, but I'm just, this is fascinating. I mean, but no, mentoring, I mentoring is a kind of attachment relationship. We think of that more like adolescent and even adult. Right. I mean, attachment is very key for infants, and it remains important as kids get older, well into adolescence. But this rules expectation dimension becomes increasingly important as kids get older, because in addition to having that kind of nurturing warmth and love, they need these kind of rules. Well, yeah. So the, my understanding of the sure, is that attachment is a product of a kid's temperament and the parenting that they receive. So it's an outcome. So especially fussy babies with overly warm parents then they can still have normal attachment. Right. But especially fussy babies with kind of blasé parents then don't have uh, good right. attachment. Right. So and, it's yeah, it's so it's, it's, it's an outcome it of the... Match. It is a match, but, it, it's a, it, but in a sense, parenting is ultimately more important in the sense that if parents really can accommodate the needs of the child, then the attachment tends to be secure. Yeah, but, but I mean, just, just that the child is evoking response. Right, absolutely. There's yeah. it, except for kids with, with kind of normal temperaments, then warmth of the parenting doesn't seem to predict attachment, right? Yeah, but there's a lot of st other stuff going on here, because attachment's about like what like separation and reunion. I mean, it's not, it, it, it's hard to actually map your thing onto right. this. These it's are, just, right, it's just a diff, they're like different animals. Um, right. But I don't even know if there's any evidence to suggest that parents who have securely attached infants are different in their parenting styles. Is there? I mean, yeah, there is. There is, there is. There's, 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 there's also. So are they more authoritative? That if you intervene yeah. And train parents, right. I know that and, part. Yeah. Okay. Right. But no, yeah. there is there is greater sensitivity of the parents. Right. But the in terms of the parents. standard styles, like the authoritative, authoritarian, and all of that, I, I there are two, sort of two different li literatures. Yeah. Okay. So then the other factor that that I looked at was was the children's confidence. Um, and what I mean by that, um, that, a lot of developmental research has looked at this idea of competence, um, with the idea being that, there, that different cultures have different ideas about what it means to be doing well in that culture, and that um, to be competent means to be doing well at the things that society says are important in that particular culture. Um, <clears throat> and so what I was interested in is, do, do children's successful uh, experiences at these important life tasks, does that influence their personality development? So do, do children tend to change in terms of personality based on their relative success or failure at these um, developmental tasks? So for example, if a child has a more positive um, experience in terms of peer relationships with other children, does that tend to make them less neurotic or ne less uh, emotional in a negative sense over time? Um, or is it the case that if children do better academically, does that tend to make them become more um, open to experience over time? Okay, so in terms of the goals of this study, so the first goal was just to look at stability in the big five traits from age 30 to age, or age 10 to age 30. And then the second goal was to, again, look at the, the predictors of change um, in terms of authoritative parenting, combining those two aspects of warmth and limits, and then um, two dom domains of competence, academic achievement, and then social competence with peers. Okay, so the data set that I am drawing from is the Project Competence uh, Longitudinal Study, and it was started by Norm 
Garmazy um, in the late 70s, early 80s. And one of his uh, graduate students at the time was Ann Maston, who then eventually was hired um, in that department as a professor. And so then she took over the reins of the study has, and has continued to track the people in it. Um, so it's a relatively small sample. It's about 200 kids. It's representative of the schools from which the children were drawn at the time. Um, so it's representative in terms of the racial makeup and also in terms of the socioeconomic status. So it, it's relatively diverse for the time and place that it was um, collected. Uh, there are four waves of data, um, but as I mentioned, I'm only going to draw from age 10 and age 30, and that's because the other waves don't have the information on pers personality traits that I'm interested in. Um, and they've had amazing retention in this study, uh, really remarkable. Uh, oh, one last point, which is that um, there's always been an emphasis in measurement on trying to use multiple measures and multiple informants for whatever constructs that are being measured. So you'll see that a lot of the, the measures I'm going to describe are composites of multiple measures from different uh, informants. Okay, so first in terms of the personality traits at age 10, um, I have essentially a measure of the big five traits. This study, Project Confidence, was designed to study risk and the development of resilience. It was, it was really the original study looking at resilience. Um, and they didn't intend for it to be a study of personality, but they assumed that children's individual differences would be really important in whether they became resilient. And so for that reason, the study collected a lot of data on children's individual differences. But I've had to do a lot of creative work to turn these into usable measures of, of the children's traits. OK, but so here are um, the, the measures of the big five that I've developed. So we have a measure of extroversion, and it shows you some sample items. And that's based just on the, an interview with the parents. Um, there's a measure of agreeableness, uh, which has to do with the children's empathy and kindness and so on versus being cynical and hostile. And that's based on both a parent and a child interview. There's a, a measure of conscientiousness. It's narrower than I would like because it's really focused on academic conscientiousness, but it's based both on parent and teacher reports, so how careful um, and fastidious children were with their work. A uh, measure of, I'm calling it negative emotionality, it's essentially a measure of neuroticism, but it, it, it indexes a bunch of different um, tendencies toward different negative emotions, being easily upset, um, easily anxious, and so on, based on a parent questionnaire, and then finally a measure of openness to experience. Um, assessing how creative children are, how excited they are about learning and ideas. Um, it also includes a measure of how interested they are in extracurriculars, which is a really good indicator of openness in, in younger children. Then at age 30, we have the uh, standard big five Measure the neo. Oh, I'm sorry. So Go ahead. When you say parent interview, what, yeah. is, is it a structured interview where it's they're asked a question <laughs> about, uh, you know, how, uh, so if you go back. Yeah, so uh, it's, How uh, outgoing is your child? Right, so the parent, the parent interview is, um, is, is very structured and the answers are um, answers to very specific items. Whereas the child interview actually um, is, is, I would say it's more of a kind of a child uh, set of child ratings in the sense that there was a very extensive interview done with the children and some of the items are taken straight from the inter interview, whereas others are the interviewer's evaluation of the child on the basis of, it, of the interview. And I think that's actually part of why this works better than a lot of child report measures is because it's being filtered through the eyes of a kind of savvy interviewer. OK, so uh, we also had another measure that, that called the MPQ, which is a much longer measure, of, a self-report measure of personality in the sample as adults. Um, it has three overarching dimensions, which are really similar to three of the big five. And um, I mean, I should say the MPQ is developed by my other advisor, Alka Telligan, who is also a PI on this study. And that's why we include this very long uh, measure in the study. And so what I did to make a more robust measure of the traits was I just I took those two measures, and for the ones where there are overlapping traits, I just averaged them. So it's a very robust kind of self-report of these personality traits at age 30. 
OK, then in terms of the predictor measures, the measure of parenting quality, as I said, it's a, it's a measure of authoritative parenting, which combines those two dimensions that I described earlier. And um, it's, again, it's a, it's a composite measure based on multiple indices from, from both the moms and the children themselves. There's no direct observation, though, the family. There is no direct observation. <coughs> in this okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I mean, there are definitely various uh, measures of parenting style out there. So I think that's one problem. And, and then the other question I have is, do you really know what the goals of the parents are? I mean, I have a similar, not a similar study, but I have a study on intergenerational transmission of preferences where we look at whether parenting style influences the correlation you know, between parents' preference and kids' preference. And that's really, I mean, you could, and we find evidence for two kinds of effects. One is some parents, you know, just have a preference for similarities. It appears to be that way. But parents, I mean, depending on what their preference, I mean, some, some parents might have the goal of making their kid more successful. They right. might observe others that have particular sets of personality right. traits. Right. And then, yeah. But you don't know. Right. I mean, I, uh, right. Two, two quick responses to that, and I c I'm happy to talk about it more. One is, I think if they were designing this study now, they would use whatever kind of standardized measures of parenting are out there, but they didn't have them at the time. So, so they use what is available. And the other is, I agree, we don't have good information on the goals of the parents. And you're going to see, and, and this is speculation on my part, the, the, um, for the traits where it's more likely that parents uniformly share goals for their children, there is an effect of parenting quality. Whereas for the traits where, there, where I would expect less uniformity in parenting goals, you don't see an impact of parenting quality. So I think that's a good point. We're not asking parents what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, it's a measure of what they tend to do yeah. toward their children. And a kind of follow-up comment on that is then if there are different parenting styles out there, then people, parents probably also have formed beliefs about which parenting style is, you know, is best. In right. What, for achieving particular goals. Right. So right. they can they can basically pick their parent. Right, that's true. And I, I mean to me it's always been striking in the in the developmental literature that there's not a lot of measurement of what parents' values are or of what they're trying to accomplish with parenting. The tendency is to use these kind of more objective measures of what parents actually tend to do toward their children, not what they're trying to accomplish. Okay, and then in terms of the measures of competence. Um, so the measure of academic achievement, achievement is based on the teacher ratings, and then it's also based on a standardized test that was given to the kids, and then also a measure of social competence, uh, which is based on peer ratings, uh, kind of similar to what Aldo was describing. But it's not focused on uh, who are your best friends, but rather who, who engages in these positive social behaviors and who engages in these kind of negative social behaviors. OK, so first in terms of the stability of the traits, um, this is just simply showing what are the correlations of these traits over time from age 10 uh, to the self-report at age 30. So you can see that for all of the traits except for openness, there's this kind of modest level of stability, which is not unusual for a 20-year study. That, that, that's roughly sort of the correlation you tend to see in these more longer uh, time frame studies. The surprising one is actually how, how strong the correlation is for openness to experience over time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any differences by trait in, uh, in reliability of the assessment, especially at the time one period. Yeah, there's not. There's not. So that doesn't, that doesn't, there's not. That doesn't account for it, right? Yeah. But you have measures of investment or, or, or experience, whatever you want to call it in between 10 and 30, like they complete school, they, right, right, they, some of them are unemployed, right. some of them go to prison. Right. So do you, you have really, really great measures of all those things. I mean, they're much So that's why you would expect, right, the correlation to be relatively low if these traits are at least are at all malleable. Right. And we think they are in this age. Right. Okay, so let me, let me talk about what we know about what predicts the changes. Okay, so I'm going to show you now a series of regressions that are predicting these adult personality traits. I entered, so I did, it, I did stepwise regressions. I don't think economists like those. That's what my friend told me. But anyhow, that's what I did. 50 years ago. But. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, so that's why they, well, they don't like them anymore. But for, that, for conceptual reasons, that's been what has tend to be used on this study. But anyhow, so the first step, we entered um, gender and age just to control for those. Then in the next step, controlled for the childhood trait. And that was merely because I, I'm trying to predict change in those traits, so I entered the um, the standing on the trade at, at age 10, and then, um, and then I entered one of the three childhood predictors. 
Okay, so it's 15 regressions. Uh, basically, it's three for each of the big five traits. So the way I'm going to, the way that I set it up is I put the three. This is the results of the three regressions for the um, for for each of the traits, all on the same one. Okay. So so first for changes in extroversion over time. I mean, you're going to see in all of these because there's some stability. The, of course, the childhood predictor is always going to account for some of the the prediction. Um, but you can see for, for extroversion that the only predictor here was social competence. So the children who were more socially competent with their peers tended to become more extroverted from age 10 to age 30. Hmm. But this is not putting in any of those other history ex events between 10 and 20. Right, right. Are you, are you going to show us that later? No, which could be done. I mean, I'm just, I was trying to keep it simple. Right, you mean like dropping out of school or? Well, yeah, or all, everything else that happened to them. Like illness, you know, don't, loss of a parent, right. uh, graduate high school. Can't get it to, oh. okay. Well, we did this in the, in the sense of the NLSY study where we had this natural variation at the age at which the test was taken, and we had measures of psychological traits as well as cognition. Well, yeah, they, they were all taken as a benchmark at, at, a, at a given age, but they were different levels of schooling at that age, just due, to, just due to the fact that the survey straddled seven different ages. So you could actually then treat that as like, an, is really almost, it was randomly assigned in some sense, you can think of it. It was by the survey, right? So you could look at the causal effect of education on these traits. No, no, that's what I'm saying, but it would be interesting at least. Right, I mean, there are a lot of interesting follow-up analyses you could do to look at the in, in between. Um, uh, but I was trying to focus on childhood predict predictors, basically, right? So, okay, so next, negative emotionality or neuroticism. Um, you can see for this, all of the predictors uh, contributed. So parenting quality made a difference. Children who did better academically became less negatively emotional over time, less neurotic. Um, and the children who were doing better socially also became less neurotic over time. Um, for conscientiousness, uh, this is such a disappointment. None of the predictors uh, predicted anything, and I, I can say more about that. Um, the results for agreeableness, uh, the results for agreeableness basically mirror the results for um, negative emotionality. You want to do it for me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, in that, again, all three of the predictors were, were predictive. Um, and then finally, for openness, uh, the only predictor that, that was significant was academic achievement. So children who did better academically became more open to experience over time, from childhood to adulthood. Can I have an idea of the direction of the effect? So se is it always positive? Sex, what is the direction of the effect? Oh, of? yeah. So I didn't mention the ones for sex, but in both, it, so sex was predictive for both conscientiousness and agreeableness, and it's kind of an uninteresting finding, which is girls are more agreeable and conscientious. Does it affect the change? It does not affect, right. Um, I didn't, I could run, I could run an interaction test on it. In most of the, I've done that with other analyses and it's never turned out to have an effect, but I, I could test it. Okay, so just to pull it all together. So extroversion and openness were not predicted by parenting quality. Um, and in general, there's a tendency for extroversion and openness to go together. They actually form a meta trait. Uh, when you look at how traits relate to each other, um, they're this sort of higher order trait that has to do with um, how eager you are to explore things. And I think what's really interesting is that, to me, this gets to your question, these are traits where I think that there's probably much more variation in what parents are trying to accomplish for their children. So parents um, may or may not want to make their kids become more extroverted or, or more introverted. And I think the same is true probably for openness. My hunch is that there are probably social class differences in how much openness is valued as a, as a trait or not. And it may be seen as, as a negative thing in some contexts. Right? I mean, we all vary a lot, I think, in how much we value openness as a trait. Um, yeah, just a, a very quick example, I mean, if you think about Ronald Reagan versus Clinton. Um, you know, Reagan I see as being very low on openness from, from what, I've, what I've, or Bush would be a good example. Where's Dan? 
right? <laughs> but whereas Clinton is super high, and if you just present a random sample of, of people with those two presidents, yeah, open in, in all kinds of experiences, right? Um, people have a reaction to those presidents based on whether they like those traits or not. So anyhow, my point is just, I'm not sure all parents are interested in making their kids become more open, and so I'm not surprised that it doesn't predict it. Uh, whereas for those traits, they are predicted by the relevant domain of childhood competence, so extroversion is predicted by being more socially competent, um, and openness increases are predicted by, by doing better in school. Uh, as I said, I have this terribly disappointing issue here with conscientiousness. I think that may be the, the, less, the least strong of the, the childhood measures in the sense that it was, it was very narrow. Um, could that be could that be referenced by us, the the idea? I mean, thinking back to the graphs where the South Koreans work the most hours but rate themselves lowest in conscientiousness, I worry that in adulthood at age thirty, the most conscientious people may be rating themselves a little more stringently at least than the least conscientious. It's possible, although the stability correlation is the same for conscientiousness as it is for the others, right? So, I, I'm not I'm not sure if that explains it. I think, it, I think the findings for these two traits are really interesting. Again, negative emotionality and agreeableness are traits that tend to uh, form a meta trait along with conscientiousness. These are traits that have to do with how well you regulate your emotions and your motivation and so on. And I think these are traits that society in general is, is, puts a lot of value on trying to um, cultivate in children, right? Parents want to help their kids manage their negative emotions. They want to help their kids become kinder and better able to get along with people. Um, so for those two, I, it makes sense to me that parenting would be important for that. But they're also related to how kids do in terms of their competence in academics and in social domains. Um, I, have, I did a, a study a long time ago, a decade ago, that, that was very consistent with this, that it seems to be the case that um, changes in negative emotionality are predicted by just not doing well at the, that the task that society considers important to you. So you become increasingly high on this trait if you're failing at important developmental tasks. Or you become better at managing it if you're tending to do well at these important societal tasks. Okay, so to wrap up, um, so parenting does predict positive change over time. It's probably especially important for helping children learn how to regulate difficult traits. It seems especially important for the traits that society considers to be important. Um, confidence at developmental tasks also predicts change in ways that I think make sense uh, for each domain. So it would be great to have more experimental studies that are directly targeting these kinds of traits to, to measure it in a clear um, causal way. And again, I think there are a lot of other contextual factors, intrapersonal factors that would be worth examining. Um, and, and I guess I would conclude by saying this to me suggests that there are routes to intervention for many of these that, for example, you may want to target parenting in specific ways for kids who are especially high on this trait of negative emotionality. Okay, so I will end there and take questions. Yeah. Just a quick question, but I, I'm probably, there, is there research showing that parenting quality is, is, uh, trans, is correlated across generations, so you end up with a parenting style like your parents? Is there any research? I mean, I'm just wondering to what, how much of parenting style is a choice? Or do you find yourself saying the same things that your mother and father <laughs> said to you? Right, you find yourself channeling your, yeah. your parents. Yeah. Right. I think that a lot of the research on, on intergenerational transmission of parenting is relatively new because obviously you would need a really long-term longitudinal study to, to test it. Um, but there is, there is starting to be some research that is showing um, at least some predictability of parenting style from the parenting that people receive themselves and some uh, continuity in terms of attachment style. Even, you know, they have these longitudinal studies where they have attachment data in infants and then they can predict their eventual attachment style with their children. So there does seem to be some continuity, but it's not so strong that, that you would think that's the only contributor to it, right? There's actually a lot of great research now showing how parents' personality traits influence their parenting um, as well. Yeah. I have a question concerning the data structure. I'm not sure I, I understood what you're doing. So you take the difference, say, year 30 minus 10. 
Well, I'm not, I mean, it's not just a subtraction, but it's, it's sort of entering it in in a stepwise way, right? So, so it's accounting for how and now what's, well... What's the, dep the, 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 the dependent variable? It's, it's a difference, right? It's an individual difference. Even if it's like a residualized change. Right, so yeah. It's accounting for all the variances predicted by the time on measurement. So it's whatever is left over in that time for the moon. But, yeah. the, but the exact dependent variables are kind of have like an arbitrary scale associated with them, don't they? I, they're z-scored within the sample, so. But these are just scores, right? Right, they're just scores. So if I were to just to transform the score to another score, any monotone transform would still be a score, and the change would be, could be very different. So I guess that would be an issue as to whether or not these are robust. That's why you can't look at mean levels. Right. Yeah, so you're just looking at rank ordering here. The rank ordering I understand better. But then for levels, I thought you were also looking at some component of level. That's, that's why you just pure it. ranks. It's just rank order stability, yeah. I only mentioned the mean level change just because I thought it was important to highlight that that's another thing that would be interesting to look at, but not what I'm doing, yeah. Any other questions? So I had a question, on, but maybe I... I guess your answer to this question will help me better understand what you're doing. What you're doing. It's sort of methodological. So the, the, this is not a concern with uh, several of them, the report, the results that you, you talk about, but uh, take the, uh, for the extroversion and openness, where what you have is social confidence predicts change in extroversion and academic confidence predicts change in openness. Is there a worry that given that the measure at time, at age 10 and the measure at age 30 are different, and that you would expect at age 10 that more extroverted kids are, are, are have better social competence and that more open kids have better academic competence, that basically what you're doing is, is detecting that there's some residual variance on the age 30. You know, if these two measures aren't perfectly correlated with each other. There's some residual variance in the um, extroversion measure, right. openness measure, and you've got another measure of extroversion or openness, right. and right. that accounts for some right. additional. Right. It, could, it could be, right? So it's a, con it's a conceptual distinction, but it, it may blur the fact that, you know, so if we had, say, a latent model, you know, they may be different latent indicators, although I think one would be much, much stronger as an indicator than, yeah. than the other one. Yeah. 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 yeah, they may have different strengths, but, yeah. but it, it changes your interpretation about whether uh, if you were to uh, you know, intervene and make a kid mm -hmm. more socially confident or academically confident would that have any long-term effects on there. Right, right. and I, so I, sh I mean, I share that same worry. Is it, is it just sort of a different indicator? I mean, in as much as I could, I tried to make sure that at, at the very least the measures didn't overlap. And the, 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 relation, the correlations are not so strong at time one that, that you would think that they're exactly the same thing. Yeah. On these data set, though, just getting back to this idea of level, do you have outcomes like earnings or, or, or employment or crime or something yes, of the sort? Lots of and how do those relate though? When you talk about the effect of parenting, how much is it being mediated through these personality changes, mm -hmm. rank order changes as you're measuring versus other mechanisms? Have you have you have you done that or right, somebody well, done that with this? Study? I've done other research where I've looked at child the childhood traits as predictors of those kinds of outcomes instead. Right, so, so I mean, it's a different question, right? Because here I'm trying to look at just changes in the traits themselves over time. No, but how the changes in the traits would lead to sort of behaviors at age, and differentials among children in behaviors at age 30, for example. Crime. Right. Because some of the intervention evidence is doing that, and it does find, again, something like what you'd call parenting, or surrogate parenting, mm -hmm. is changing some of these traits, which are themselves then affecting lifetime outcomes on crime and earnings and schooling. Right, I mean if the study were structured differently it would be interesting to look at whether changes in the traits themselves then lead to changes in the outcomes. I mean there, there are other studies that, that are multi-wave where you, could, you can tease that apart. Um, I can't do that with this data set because I mean at this point the personality traits are measured at age 30 and there hasn't been a follow-up since then. Could you just do it with the other outcomes measured at age 30? I mean, I know it wouldn't be staggered in time the way you would want to ideally, but did, how many objective measures of life outcomes do they take? There are age? so many. I mean, this, the, the strength of this data set is that, you know, it's, it's a small n, but the wealth of information available is immense. So there's, there's tons of information about crime and, um, earnings and, and so on. So there, there are many other questions. It would just be interesting to compare your findings with those from the other intervention studies, both the parenting and the 
the, in these, basically, I think the parenting interventions, even the tools of the mind stuff, mm -hmm. is, a, is a version of that, is it not? I mean, what, but what is the underlying research question? Is it whether parenting style can influence personality traits or character skills, as we have called them? Yeah, I mean, in this And if that is the question, I think that then it might also be that your, the approach that you suggest is also not the one that I would follow, because she, foc she only measures, um, say, a, subsets of, a subset of all traits that might be relevant. Right. And for instance, if that yeah, yeah, traits. exactly. So you get so some econometric issues associated with that. But put that to, in principle, you could at least address that question. Right. Yes. right. At mean, least I acknowledge it. And then, but then my, my follow-up question would be: What is your conclusion then on the paper? Is, I mean, this is then a, a lower bound estimate on the effects of parenting style on, on the formation of um, traits. of traits because. First, I mean, you miss a lot of traits, and it might be that parents might exactly invest in these traits more than in the ones that you measure. For instance, they might invest a lot in getting, making their child more patient. Well, and patience it's, it's is, part of, is part of agreeableness. Okay. I mean, the, these traits themselves it's are very It's part of broad, agreeableness, right. but maybe not the way that economists would right, define it. Right, 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 right. I mean, there are a lot of other traits. There are lots of other things that you could look at. So from a personality trait model, point of view, it's, it's pretty broad, right? Because it is really including the breadth of, of the traits that receive most of the attention. However, there are lots of other aspects of personality that would be really great to look at. Like, for example, um, the goals that the children themselves have, right? Do, you know, in what way is parenting shaping the goals that's, that the, the children set for themselves as they're moving into adulthood? Um, um. And, and then, then another question, is this actually motivated by a paper um, by Matthias Döpke and Fabrizio Zilibotti, where they actually also look at parenting style and then they focus on the, the level of a trait, say patience or risk aversion. And they generate different implications of parenting style um, given the environment that, that the kid and the parent grow up in. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, um, you know, you might choose for a supporting parenting style in order to make your kid more patient, but it, you know, it depends on whether you live in a rural area or right. in a town. Right, or if the child's in poverty. Or exactly. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think those are all important questions. This, uh, this is study is unusual in the sense that I was trying to predict personality as an outcome. So I think we're used to thinking about personality as being a predictor and as a contributor to these other outcomes that we're interested in. And most of the research I myself have done have, has, it's been focused on that, has been using childhood personality trying to predict these adult outcomes that we think are important, like academic achievement or, um, or, or the quality of a person's marriage and so on. So I, I'm trying to flip it on its head because I'm just interested in personality itself as an outcome and the, the general kind of behavioral tendencies that people display as adults. Because I think that's worth studying too. Partly, though, because it leads to, to all of those outcomes. But, but I guess what I ask, coming back to that question, is what do you make, since it is a rank-stable measure? Who cares, in some sense? I mean, in some sense, we know that personality is very malleable, right? So the very fact that you get sort of low predictability simply means there are, I don't know, what would you interpret from that? The fact that there are a lot of other things we can do from age 10 to age 30. But that's one interpretation, right? That would be, yeah, I mean, that would be one interpretation. Although, I mean, my focus, again, is, is not on the stability, uh, but on what's predicting the changes over time. Well, but predicting in ranks. Right. That's what I'm saying. So moving around in ranks could actually be uh, a good thing, right? So in other words, rank to rank. So I, that's what I'm just not quite sure what the interpretation is for policy. To find stable rank in this would be, I mean, I understand if it's like perfect rank, there's not much we could do, maybe, because it's really highly. But short of that, finding very poor stability or very negative even, negative correlations. So what? I mean, it seems to me that's a, that's a real opportunity for intervention, right? Because it isn't set in stone. We can do something about it. Right. But I also think it's important to understand what, what predicts um, development over time. But I mean, it's not the development in terms of what we care about. I mean, it's yeah. not ultimately the rank. It's kind of what you do with the trait or the, the skill or whatever you want to call it, right? Right, and then I guess implicit in what I'm doing, I mean, there's so much research showing that adult personality is really critical for lots of different aspects of functioning in adulthood. So that to me, it's, it's worth understanding sort of the, the ultimate place that, that people are tending to end up with in terms of their traits. But is it the change? I mean, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is, that, is it important that we know the change and the rank between 30 and 10, which is kind of what you're looking at here? as opposed to the kind of final destination of the rank. 
itself at age, at age 30? Or in, I, I think so. I mean, if you're interested in trying to understand change, right? I mean, if you're trying well, to well, understand. By, by definition, but I'm wondering, do we really, I think we want to predict performance, say, at age 30, which it wouldn't necessarily be a function of these changes in ranks. It would be more a matter of the absolute level of the trade, which you haven't isolated yet. There, there's some research showing that changes predict above and beyond um, the actual level of the trade. So changes for some implicate some other things going on also instead of just, just level. So it might be interesting to find people that not only are you know at a high level, but low level going up. Um, no, that's a different question. That's an interesting question, how much you can move around. And we know that stability, we know that the rank, if you were to do the same thing for IQ, you'd be much more stable, right? And just in terms yeah. of the correlation between 10 and 30. But if you were to, and to me, that's the target of opportunity going on here. But I'm just, I'm just not quite sure what I'd take out of this. So would you consider it important to understand the prediction of adult personality at all? Yeah, but I mean in terms of level and how that manifests itself in behavior. So the idea is that like more conscientiousness is better for outcomes. So and then you want to see where the parenting style gets you to a higher level of conscientiousness. I think that's, that's the question. As opposed to relative conscientiousness, right? That's the but I'm not sure, how would you, how would you measure that longitudinally? Behavior, by final behavior. Like, we think conscientiousness is partly how much do you show up for time, okay. see, work I on time, problem, and so forth. I think the problem is partly just that you want to tie it to sort of what, what would be considered outcomes of personality in a way. Well, right? but that was the point Tim was making, though, that in some sense personality is really just a measure of on certain traits, on certain tasks. Mm -hmm. And these are other tasks. And some of those tasks are things like, you know, how well do I show up and how, how pleasant am I with other people and on and on and on. Those are all, I mean, I view those as really the same question. And in some sense, those other, these second kinds of measures are less vulnerable to the kind of question about monotone transformations. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least they have some meaning. Mm -hmm. The guy's earning 500,000 a year versus 50 cents a year. So. Right, right, right. So I mean, if, if, that, if that's the end product that you're interested in trying to predict, there is already a lot of research that's, that's addressed that question in terms of how these childhood traits predict those kind of objective indicators of you know, success in different domains. And it's just a different question. Yeah. There's not a lot of, there, the, right, people have looked at that question empirically, whether parents' traits influence strongly how they rate their children, and it do, it's not strongly predictive of how. So you're, you're confident that the parents' assessment of their child's personality is not influenced by their own reference points or their own personality traits? I, I'm comfortable with that in general in the literature. That, that, that's a question that has been addressed and it does not seem to be the case. I mean, there, is, there are other effects. So there are so sibling comparison effects that, that come into play in parents' reports, you know, where they contrast their siblings um, and that has an impact on, on the ratings that they make of their children. But it's not, it does not seem to be influenced by the parents' own traits. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you.